members, attendees of the conference, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on emerging technologies in the education sector. But let me tell you uh, just very briefly uh, who I am. So although my title is IT Director for the Computer Science Department at the University of Toronto, I am actually a computer scientist. And uh, what that uh, means is that I provide the computing for the teaching and the research in computer science that's done at the University of Toronto. It's a top 10 department in the world. And uh, we specialize in a number of areas in computer science, particularly AI. Um, I'm going to speak about some challenges in emerging technologies and some innovations that we have tried in Toronto and uh, are sharing with you in the hopes that they might be of some use at the University of Central Asia. Before I start though, I'd like to say that this was at the same time one of the easiest and one of the most difficult presentations to prepare. The reason being that to fit in 20 odd minutes something that would take three or four hours to, to speak about, deciding which 20 minutes is most important was quite difficult. And I'd like to thank specifically the CIO of the University of Central Asia, uh, uh, Shaukat Khan, and uh, Alina Rahim, who uh, provided the student perspective uh, from the University of Central Asia, to help me understand what was the most important 20 minutes of the three hours that I could speak about emerging technologies in the education sector. So, I'm only going to speak of a few challenges and innovations. And uh, without further ado, let's start with the one that is actually closest to my own experience. So 34 years ago, I, through the benefits of a government program, I was a student at the University of Toronto in computer science. And through the benefits of a government program, I was able to spend a summer doing computer science research. And my pay was actually paid for by the government. I loved it. I thrived. And I thought, hey, I, I found the place I want to be. So I never left. So I spent uh, 30 years working for the University of Toronto. And um, from that experience, um, I want to focus on only certain of the emerging technologies. So we have AI, machine learning, big data, and cloud computing. Other uh, technologies uh, which are well worth speaking about, like virtual reality, the Internet of Things, or blockchain, we won't have time. I'm not going to be addressing those. And I'm going to be focusing on three areas of challenge and innovation. So one area of challenge is the computing for AI, which is called GPU computing. Another area of challenge is information security. And the third area of challenge is actually taking all this stuff and making it practical, using it to change the world. I mean, every student arrives at university and says, I'd love to do something that would actually change the world. I want to make my mark on the world. So, one of the areas that uh, the University of Toronto was quite active in is intelli artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I have a slight confession to make. So there's this, um, there's a lot of buzz about AI and machine learning these days. And a little tiny bit of it is my fault. So, uh, the, some key work was done at the University of Toronto by Professor Jeffrey Hinton and his students. And um, so, deep learning or machine learning was a, has been a discipline in computer science for quite a few years now. And um, through the 1990s and 2000s, it was used in various fields, uh, credit card processing to tell if the crooks are stealing money from your credit card. But there were some challenges with it. I mean, error rates were quite high. It was never quite as good as what people could do. And where it was really being used was where the computers provided extra capacity. I mean, a computer can look at a lot more credit card transactions per hour than a person can. But in 2012, that all changed. So Jeffrey Hinton and his students 
did some innovative work and published a paper called ImageNet Classification with Deep Convolutional Neural Networks. I want, I want to explain very briefly what the science of machine learning is. So you see some shapes in front of you over here. You see some shapes. Look at those shapes. Which one's not like the others? Even a two-year-old can tell you that the one on the bottom right is not like the others. So traditional computer science has two main techniques for looking at the world. One technique is programming. And programming takes a number of rules and tests. So is it this? Test if it's that. If it's this, then do this thing. If it's that, then do that thing. So if you were trying to classify those shapes and you were given a square, a triangle, and a circle, uh, as a programmer, you might say, well, OK, let's see. Geometry talks about regular polygons. And so these are regular polygons. And so I'll write some code to test to see if the sides are equal and the angles are equal and so forth. Then we have a special case for the circle, which is the limit of a regular polygon as the number of sides goes to infinity. And so you'd have a bunch of tests and so forth. And the advantage of programming is that programming works before you've even seen your very first example. Another technique that's used in traditional computer science are databases. The databases are just, here's a pile of data, let's all store it and retrieve it when we need it. So you might say, okay, I'm going to store an example of a square, an example of a triangle, an example of a circle. The power of databases is that it's driven by the data. You don't have to know in advance what you want. What you do is you collect a lot of data and then you use that data answer to answer questions. But the weakness of the database is that it does not know what to do with something it hasn't seen before. So machine learning adds a third technique called a neural network. And a neural network takes a whole bunch of examples of data, like a database, and trains a special data construct called a neural network. I won't go into the details. It's, uh, it, I could speak for a while about that. Uh, but what it does, it trains the neural network on a bunch of example databases, I'm sorry, uh, pieces of data, and then uh, the neural network can answer questions about not only have you seen this data before, but have you seen something that looks like it before? And that's an enormously powerful technique because you can show a, neural, a trained neural network something it's never seen before, and it can give you a reasonable answer about it based on the things that it has seen. So for example, a neural network looking at this example of squares, triangles, and circles, if we, if we trained it on the square, the triangle, and the circle, and then we showed it something it's never seen before, the Pentagon, it will say, yes, that looks something like what I've seen before. Show it the circle, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Show it the weird squiggle at the bottom, it'll say, no, I, I haven't seen anything that looks like that before. So this is a new basic computing technique which complements databases and um, the programming. So one of the things that makes this technique a bit of a challenge is that it's very computationally intensive. It really works. It, require, it works the computer hard. And it's the training that's the problem. And so this is where I came in. I was responsible for research computing in the department. And Jeff Hinton and his students had a really big computing problem. How the heck can we do this work when uh, it takes months, potentially, to train a network. But we discovered that if we did this work on GPUs, which is the graphics card portion of a computer, rather than the CPU, which is the usual processing portion of a computer, we could take advantage of the fact that the GPU hardware was designed to do many, many, many things at once. That's called a thread of execution. So a CPU can maybe do you know, 8 to 64 threads of execution. That's 8, 8 to 64 things at once. Now keep in mind, a computer does things at once often by switching very quickly between them. But uh, this is actually legitimately multiple threads of, 
of execution of thing, actually really doing these things at once. But a GPU can do hundreds and thousands of simultaneous threads of execution. And that turns out to be really powerful for training neural networks. And so we did experimental computing. Essentially, we took rather untried, it was, you know, other people had tried using GPUs for computing, um, but it was still a little bit flaky. The GPUs would crash, the software was a little bit off. We were using the CUDA software from NVIDIA. We were to try and do something of the scale that Jeff wanted. We needed two of these GPUs. We got the best ones we could find, which at that time were uh, GTX 580s which was the fanciest, most expensive gaming card you could buy. All the gamers were buying it so that they could play fancy computer games. But we were doing science on them. And so we were able to train uh, Jeff's model in five days of continuous computing. Each time you trained the model, it took five days. You had to run this thing for five days. But it worked. Jeff showed that the error rates in machine learning could be dramatically reduced by increasing the depth of the neural network. It's called deep learning for that reason. Uh, and given sufficient computing power, we could match or even exceed the, the comparison power of a human person uh, on some of these tasks for the first time. And so that's why AI is so exciting today, because Jeff proved that it works. This is one form of AI that actually works. And it's busy transforming the world. And I actually kind of feel kind of good that I had a, a small part uh, in that. So I'm going to go to another example now. We're talking a lot about the cloud these days. Big data, cloud computing. And uh, often in these conversations about the cloud and big data, there's concerns that come out with privacy and security. So years ago at the University of Toronto, uh, not in my department, but in the Department of Psychology, there was a graduate student named Anne Kavukian. And she graduated with a PhD in psychology. And then she joined the Ontario government so Ontario uh, is to, um, to Canada what Narin is to Kyrgyzstan. And she became the privacy, after, uh, after a career in the public service, she became the privacy commissioner of Ontario. And her job was for the government of Ontario to preserve data privacy for its citizens. And she took her learning in psychology that she had earned at, the, at at the University of Toronto, and she came up with an approach to privacy and to security called security or privacy by design. Now those are her seven principles, but I would distill them as saying this, that privacy and security is about the person. It's not about the system or the data, it's about the person. It needs to be person-centric, and it needs to be built in from the beginning, from, by design not added on afterwards. And so there was a very good talk yesterday, um, uh, I hope uh, you remember it, by, uh, about GDPR, the uh, general uh, data protection uh, regime uh, that uh, the European Union is doing. Well, this was one of the fundamental principles that was used to come up with GDPR. And so this psychology grad student ended up changing the world in computing by applying her, her knowledge of people to computing. So these are two examples of taking challenges that we are facing in the computing field and coming up with innovations that actually worked. And as a result, we have tools today that are opening up new vistas and new possibilities. The third area of challenge and innovation I want to talk about is how do we get all this stuff from the university sector, the educational sector, to society? 
And so what I want to do is offer some of our experience at the University of Toronto at the Computer Science Department in Canada as ways that we have tried to do this in the hopes that perhaps they might be of some use to you. So I'm going to be talking about four different ways uh, that we do it, that we, that we have tried to, to apply uh, computing from society and uh, from the university to society. So all of these involve a partnership between industry, government, and education. I think of it as a three-legged stool. If you cut one of the legs off, you can't sit on a stool with only two legs. It falls over one way or the other. But with three legs, the stool is stable and strong. So the first one is the thing that actually got me into the role I am today, which is the Undergraduate Student Research Award. This was a government program that would pay for a student who is working at a university, uh, who was studying at a university, uh, to do research in the summer. So I did that, I loved it. I did three of them for three summers, and I ended up working full-time at the university doing research uh, programming um, because of this award. Uh, another is the professional experience year. So the professional experience year is a way of taking a skilled student, so in our department, this happens after the third year of studies. A skilled student, a student who already has real experience in programming and other computer science skills, but is not completed their program, so it's a four-year program. After the third year, they take a year off. But we encourage them to take this year off because what we do is we try and place them in a company. And what we say to the company is we say, here you're going to get a really good computer science student who has had three years of solid computer science learning, and now you get to have them for a whole year. So give them a real project, something that's really substantial. So often this turns into a job after the student graduates. And, this, and the companies, they're actually getting real value from their students. So after the, the year is over, they come back and complete their fourth year of their degree, and so often they then are offered a job by the company they did their professional experience year for. A couple other uh, approaches that we use, and also partnerships with industry and government, we have a program, and it's applied master's program, called the master's, Master of Science in Applied Computing. And what this is, is a master's degree at the graduate level that is offered not just to our graduating students, but anyone who applies. It's a professional program, it's, so we get applications from all over the world. It includes courses, but it also includes an internship an internship, and it's an eight-month internship in a company. And it's focused on some research that the, that the student is doing. So there's a research focus on this internship. The salary of the student is subsidized by a government program called MyTax. And the subsidy, the purpose of the subsidy is to help encourage the industry partner to take on the student because it's a big thing to take a student at the master's level. I mean, they need to be paid fairly well. Otherwise, they're just going to go off and get a job somewhere. And so the MyTax program helps the company pay the student market rates for that eight-month internship. And this is fantastic. We have companies lining up to get our students. We have no hope, in fact, of being able to, to fill all the internship requests that we're getting. And that allows us to be selective about which companies we're working with. So we look for the benefit both to the student and to the company. And we're getting students applying from all over the world uh, to this program. And the reason they pick our program over other professional programs, which were just um, you know, course-only uh, programs that uh, universities use to get money from students, is because this internship is real value. Also, they pay, in, they pay tuition for this program, but the, the money they earn during their internship helps them recoup much of that cost. And the last thing we, uh, I want to talk about in this area of what we do 
is the Department of Computer Science Innovation Lab. And this is a sort of incubator for startups, but it's based around one of our courses. The course is called the Business of Software. And the focus of this course is, okay, you're a computer scientist, you've learned how to create software. I and mean, our focus primarily is software. How do you turn it into a business? How do you create a startup? How do you apply it in industry? And so the students will actually create a startup business as part of their course. And the best ones, we will use, we will, in the incubator, we will turn into real companies. So we find investors, uh, we, uh, we, we make partnerships, so we don't, it's not just computer science students, so we'll bring in students from other disciplines as well. And, um, we, and we've had uh, quite a number of uh, startup companies come out of this, and they've been quite successful. One example is uh, Ross Intelligence. It's a company that partnered with IBM, used their Watson software, which is the software that won Jeopardy, which is a game show in the US, and it's excellent at sort of natural language inferencing, trained it on a giant database of Canadian law, and then sold a digital law librarian to small law offices. And this digital law librarian is a computer system that finds all the relevant cases for the case that you're working on. It's extremely effective and the lawyers love it. And so this has turned out to be a very successful company. Now, what about applying this to Central Asia? I mean, I can't tell you what to do. I mean, you guys are creative and innovative in your own right. I can share my, my thoughts about how this might work for you. So one, one area of interest is the fact that, I mean, Kyrgyzstan, if you consider Naren, Kyrgyzstan, it's fairly small. So to, to boost the size, one of the ways to do that is to cooperate with the region. So, we're, so the rest of my uh, words will be directed at sort of the Central Asian region, not just uh, Kyrgyzstan. Leverage the strengths. So I have a picture of Kyrgyzstan here. Um, I picked it because uh, this is where the campus is. But look at where it is. So to the east is China, a computing powerhouse. To the west is Russia, a computing powerhouse. To the south is India and Pakistan, emerging economies with, uh, ap with growing computing strengths. So Central Asia is actually literally in the center of a ferment of activity. So exploit that location. Kyrgyzstan also has an international outlook. What I mean by that, first, there's one sense of international, that is, within the Central Asian region, there's cooperation. The University of Central Asia is amazing in that it's, it, is, it encompasses three different countries in the region. So there's a sense of regional international outlook. But I was very impressed that the government of Kyrgyzstan is building Tunduk, out of work that was done in Estonia. There is this increasing willingness to borrow expertise, knowledge, experience from wherever it can come. And that's a very powerful uh, uh, willingness. The population of Kyrgyzstan and of Central Asia is also a real asset. It's hard to learn new things when you're old, but when you're young, you can learn new things. You, and the population is young and growing. And I was very impressed just earlier today when I saw the, the student projects that the students uh, had done. There's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of energy, and there's this openness to change, to new things, to doing things better. And finally, Central, the University of Central Asia is a key piece in improving education in the region. With education, we can do a lot. This is an unprecedented opportunity for the region. 
because emerging technologies are new for everybody. They're new for the West, they're new for the East. There are so many unsolved problems in deep learning. There are so many unsolved problems in all the other emerging technologies. Big data, cloud computing, you name it. Those problems can be solved by you in Central Asia just as well as us old farts in the West. <laughs> Quite frankly, if you invest in capability, and I mean human capability, education, technology transfer, innovative companies, there is no reason why the next leap in an emerging technology can't be done on the basis of work conducted here. I encourage the University of Central Asia to in, uh, invest in, in improving its teaching and engaging in research and uh, to continue its mission to transform the region and make it possible to, to contribute to the, world's, to the world scene as I believe it can really do. Thank you very much.